stepping into a world full of unknowns, like the hyperdynamic Bering Strait is not typical anymore for today's Westerner. It seems as if life in our modern world is meant to be safe. Everything is currently focused on fear, consumption and quick satisfaction. For explorers there's a strong desire to counter such a life of calculated luxuries. Being stripped of the cocoon of guarantees, warmth and complacency really brings us back to the essence of life that may be seen as true survival. Rediscovering priorities and reappreciating the preciousness of life is something I need on a regular basis. The apparent nonsense of my expeditions is actually a true ballad of contentment and a passionate cry for intensity in life. I wish that same zest of life for anyone. The Bering Strait is a body of water squeezed between Alaska and Siberia, separating and at the same time connecting the Pacific Ocean to the Arctic Ocean. The maximum distance between the two continents is a mere 97 kilometers. During the winter months, the Bering Strait struggles to cover itself with an icy carpet. However, the strong dynamics of different currents and the impact of the ever-present wind don't allow a coherent ice mass to form. This place has always held a great attraction for adventurers, all with the same goal, to make it across. Dan Richard has been living here for 27 years. He's seen expeditions come and go. It's about the last of the, the big expeditions that can be found that hasn't been conquered. Uh, most all of them, at least somewhere in history or somewhere along the line, somebody has done it. And here, the Eskimos long ago used to do it between the islands. But as far as going from America to Russia, nobody's ever accomplished it not even the natives. It's just never been anything that anybody's been able to do. And so uh, I think it's pretty attractive for expeditioners. Belgian Arctic explorer Dixie Dansacour and his American colleague Troy Henkels came up with the ambitious idea to be the first to succeed crossing this barely frozen stretch of water. It's an opportunity not only to challenge myself physically and mentally um, in what we're about to partake in, but also the opportunity to experience this environment, to step out of a normal lifestyle and experience an Arctic environment. My desire is to realize what I'm doing with my life, what nature means to me, and what I can do to live in tune with nature. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Nome. The 
crash of the Iditarod trail sled dog race. The local time is now 11.45 a.m. May we please ask you to keep your seatbelt fastened until the airplane has come to a complete stop and the engines have been switched off. The small settlement of Nome was founded in 1898 and was named after the nearby river. Around the end of the 19th century, the town bustled with gold fever. When in 1898 the first gold was struck, it really put Nome on the map. In less than a month, over 10,000 prospectors had set up home there. It didn't take long before the first steamships moored at the settlement, and it wasn't long before Nome became a thriving town. Today, Nome counts some 4,000 inhabitants. It's here that Dixie and Troy will make their final preparations for their polar quest. It's also from here that Julie Brown, Dixie's wife, will man the communication center. My day is pretty full with just hearing from Dixie and Troy, getting their needs filled, um, making sure that the weather predictions, especially um, currents in the sea, um, that takes time. All the expedition's gear has arrived in Nome. Before being flown to Wales, the expedition's actual point of departure, Dixie and Troy give the equipment a final going over. So that can stay in here, that's the mast, that's the, the other sail. Take that up. It's taken them a year to research and collect all the specialized gear needed for such an expedition. In March 2004, Dixie and Troy left for a month to Alaska to get their first taste of the Bering Strait. It was clear from the outset that this was to be no ordinary expedition. Water is their greatest enemy. To cross open leads, Troy and Dixie would have to use dry suits. Norwegian polar explorer Borg Ausland had done this already in 1999. However, the suits he used offered room for improvement. They led to clumsy movements and had restricted eyesight. So they decided that they could do better. They finally located a company in Arcata, California, who came up with an improved version. A must when you want to um, calculate all risks. It allows us to progress in the most um, wet conditions or in the most humid conditions. If you have them straight down, straight down they'll get cold pretty quick. You can feel the pressure in the water going in. Whoa! <laughs> what was it? We can swim in them, we can use them as flotation devices. Um, they're just wonderful and, and especially when you consider it as dangerous. Together with a couple of windsurfing friends, Dixie developed the Sled Cat, a totally new concept to cross wide open leads with the sail-powered Sled Catamaran. Which uh, is a, a structure whereby we put both sleds together by means of two skis that are rigged together. It's a very solid um, flotation device. We put uh, them in the water and we can jump on it and paddle. A balanced diet is of utmost importance to every polar explorer. Together with a number of dietitians, Dixie and Troy have put together a very specific polar diet. This is mixed vegetables, dehydrated mixed vegetables. And so we'll mix all this up and add a bunch of other things to the mixed vegetables to increase the calorie. To maximize space distribution in the sleds, the portions are run through a grinder several times. I have 
have squirrel food for you. Woohoo! Excellent. Yeah. Great. Good. Came out really good. Oh, Great. Excellent. It's a cool grinder. Vegetarian sausage. What making? <laughs> make it make from this. <laughs> wow. Well, it's a sausage grinder. Oh. But this is good, well done. This yeah. is all the veg, the whole thing. Everything. Excellent. We will only add hot water to uh, defreeze it. No cooking uh, because we don't want to do the dishes. Do you, Troy? No, no, no. No dishes. In the morning we have tea and coffee. There might be a piece of chocolate left over from the previous day. And then there's a... Um, a mixture of this stuff together with cereals and some sugar and that's that's about it for the morning. In normal circumstances a human being needs approximately two and a half thousand kilocalories per day. Taking into account the heavy physical effort required in demanding polar conditions, Dixie and Troy will need six thousand. Every gram counts. To carry as little weight as possible, all the food is taken out of its packaging. Day rations are carefully weighed and vacuum packed. I don't know if they lost power or whatever, but anyway, Safety is know. the expedition's priority number one. Should the polar explorers run into an emergency situation, they'll need to call for assistance. Estimated time uh, that this is going to be going on. Have you looked at the website? Yeah, there's a pretty very interactive website with our progress and audio feeds and all that. Sure. But uh, Julie will show you. Uh, okay. Evergreen Helicopters is the only private company providing sea search and rescue operations above the Bering Strait. Thanks, sir. Okay, Troy. Okay. Good luck on your Hopefully we won't see you out there. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know. Uh, thanks a lot. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. When the film crew arrives at the apartment, Julie, Troy and Dixie are sitting at the table. I check with Eric. I simply report the situation. We're not starting any search and rescue. The whole idea is that at 2 a.m. Alaskan time, you've been now missing for 30 hours. Knowing that they're not going to take off until there's light of day, the pilot has to be alerted at home. He's got to get to the airport, all that stuff. So. By 30 hours, we're setting it in motion. Do you want to talk about the rest of this stuff? Um, well, it's, it's been decided. I thought it was... It was what's so there to, yeah, what's there to talk about? Worst case scenario? That could be any number of... Okay. Maybe. All right. The expedition members discuss the possibility of leaving that same day, since heavy storms are forecast in the coming days for the Wales region, which will result in all aircraft being grounded. Good morning, I just wanted to check to see what it looks like for flying to Wales today. Oh, okay. If we could be there within the half hour. Okay. Great. Mixed emotions, excitement, apprehension, everything, it's been a long time in the making, so we're ready to go. The Bering Air Departure Hall is unlike any other. Tickets are filled out by hand, and there's a marked absence of attractively dressed checking girls. Luxury is one thing a person doesn't need when embarking on a journey to the end of the world. The silence of an imminent departure is universal. Everyone makes the most of those last moments together.
On board their light aircraft, Dixie and Troy peer through the cabin windows in excitement. Beneath them lies an apparently peaceful layer of ice over the Bering Strait, or so it would seem. The runway at Wales is nothing more than a frozen strip of ice. A cold wind is blowing. Unloading the plane takes only 15 minutes. Welcome to the end of the world. Wales is lost in the great white expanse of ice and snow that encircles the community. During wintertime, the only access is by plane. All necessary goods for survival are flown in. With its 750 inhabitants, Wales was once the largest Inupiat Eskimo town in northwest Alaska. Today, it's the fifth smallest town in the region. Young people leave their birthplace because of the lack of any future for them. The only link they have with the town is what remains of a fast disappearing Eskimo culture. Ellen and Dan Richards' living room has been transformed into a polar explorer's workshop. We had one out last night. We don't have to go too far out. This is plenty, and then we have this as a beverage. Dan is intrigued by Dixie and Troy's equipment. The question remains, however, if whether all this state-of-the-art equipment will get them across the strait to Siberia. As far as their skills for battling the water and the ice and stuff are, are quite good, and they've got some pretty good materials to work with. But I just think that uh, trying to get between here and Little Dimey, the 26 miles, and uh, lots of open water, lots of currents, lots of bad weather, the possibility of crossing is high, the possibility of crossing the Bering Straits is low. The weather in Wales can change very quickly. This is because the town is surrounded by mountains. Predicting the weather with any accuracy is about as difficult as predicting the winning numbers of the national lottery. I would really hate to tell somebody what the weather's going to do in the following day because uh, the odds are that uh, maybe 70-80% are right, but the chances of being wrong and being in the middle of the Bering Straits when you find out that you're wrong is, is too deadly for me to even... I wouldn't even attempt it. The expedition members decide to set up a weather station to help determine the best day for departure. We're hoping for a, a calmer day um, with ice that is drifting towards the Wales shore. And then for the rest, um, I'm inshallah kind of attitude. <laughs> Let it happen. It's soon more than apparent just what nature is capable of in this region. The two polar explorers are confronted with a mass of ice drifting through the Bering Strait. This mass of ice and snow races through the strait at a speed of eight kilometers per hour. Nice little tool, huh? Yeah, it's excellent. Mm -hmm. Interesting to see the variations throughout the day, particularly in the wind speed, how it changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The weather station works well. By comparing the data collected with other sources, Dixie and Troy have a good idea of the weather systems. But the weather is anything but optimal. It almost looks like that's something right there. But yes. It's probably just a break in the clouds. Mm -hmm. And then things are turning around here. Yeah. And then here. Way too warm, one. 
Way too much wind, two, three. Uh, <coughs> wind the wrong direction. Wrong direction. Yeah. In some way. Uh, too much humidity. Way too humid. So we'll just have to wait a bit. On top of all that, there's a severe storm heading towards Wales and the ice conditions in the Bering Strait are terrible. In these conditions, it would be foolish to set off. It's better to be patient and wait for some good conditions and then slowly make our way into the expedition instead of being rushed off and uh, being confronted with the wrong conditions. Constant storms and foul weather envelop Wales. To top it all, the incoherent masses of ice floating on the Bering Strait preclude any attempt to cross it. Just going out in these stormy conditions is dangerous. Eight people are now cooped up indoors, each keeping busy in his or her own way. Can it get better than this? No. We sit here right all day and eat and watch. According to the weather forecast, there's a clear window of weather expected. Dixie and Troy are full of energy now and are looking forward to finally being able to set foot on that ice. What do you think, Dan? What's that? We're thinking of um, staying south of the islands because once you hit this line and there's a nor northerly current, you're off. Right? Up we here. definitely have to stay as far south as you possibly yeah, yeah. stay. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Because the currents are going to continually take you north. See? So the farther south you stay, the better off you. What you really want to do is this fairway rock. Yeah, here. You want to keep it way, way to the north. To of the end. north. So we have to head yep. south. South of fairway rock. Yep. A week has gone by and a second departure day is pinned down. However, the euphoria of that day is short lived means to do an expedition but there's us there's people there's you know it's complicated business so the only red line through the expedition is safe everything was in order Dixie and I are fit all the gears in place um, weather's perfect out and we had the unfortunate phone call that uh, our backup helicopter rescue helicopter um, is broken and we'll be waiting for two to three weeks on spare parts there are no helicopters available for a backup, which means our safety. So we are on standby until something else can be arranged or the pilots return. It's again a, a blow in the face, but uh, you didn't hear me scream and shout. Uh, it's just yet another uh, challenge. It can be a little tough, but that's it's part of the game we play. Now we can only hope that um, when everything else gets lined up with the, the rescue company that will have the weather for departure or we could be further delayed. Julie had talked to Gerald and said something that there were two icebreakers or there were icebreakers in Kodiak that had helicopters. Uh, What gives us a chance to reach the Diomedes at what speed? If we move oh, yeah. at 25 oh, yeah. miles an hour west, we'll be there in an hour. After five days, a solution has been found for the grounded helicopter. Moreover, a break in the foul weather offers a nice window of opportunity. Great uh, pleasure and in anticipation of um, whatever's to come. The unknown you you cannot describe. That's why uh, 
it's good to keep uh, a couple of secrets for the future and adventure has to remain adventure. It's, it's supposed to be that way. It looks like they're all set. Tomorrow morning, the Bering Strait Odyssey can depart. Good morning, everyone. This is Dixie on Wednesday, the 30th of March. Today, we are pleased to announce to you that uh, it will be a go. Uh, it is our day of departure and uh, we're more than psyched to get this thing rolling. Here's Troy. Hello, greetings from Wales. We look out the window and see clear skies and the sun just just getting ready to come up over the horizon. We're getting dressed and packing our sleds and we'll be off shortly. And much excitement here. So thanks for following. Bye. sunrise just everything was going well get to the water's edge um, no wind almost no wind just enough for the sail system all went fine you know just the routine gestures so we went downwind and uh, saw that there was a zone of uh, slush, new eyes formed, rubbery eyes. We were caught in some bad ice, slushy ice, uh, couldn't make headway. The big scare came when uh, more of that ice was coming. We both knew what that meant, that the sleds could get covered, we had to find safer grounds. Things were starting to close in. Dixie put his skis on. Went two, three steps and went through the ice. I tried to go back to the sleds because I was three steps away. Uh, stuck with my skis under under an ice layer that was moving. We got a rope to him and he swam and pulled and got back to the sled and climbed up and I pulled as hard as I could and got him in just in the split second nick of time. Are you okay? Can you hear? Okay, are you there? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? As arranged, Dixie reports in every day at 8 o'clock in the evening. Didn't make it and went through the ice and then... Uh, he tries to tell Julie about the close call he'd had that day, but a bad line leaves Julie confused. Okay, bye. Whew. Don't need one of those calls for a while. What do you think she's going to say? Else. Moments like these are hard, but Julie knows how important this expedition is for Dixie. The art is to find clarity in the apparent chaos. When he does live out these expeditions, he's just so content and so happy that it's clear he's on the right path. And uh, it's been three years since his last one, and he. In Dutch, they say kribbelen. He, he, he's itching for it. He needs it. 
So the drive obviously comes from somewhere inside of him, his soul. In all fairness, if he told me tomorrow that he was finished with them and we could go and live in our little mountain hut somewhere, I'd be fine. <laughs> but, uh, but this is important to him and it makes him so happy. Night falls over the Bering region. The bars in Nome are doing their usual good business. A little further north, however, two polar explorers crawl exhausted into their sleeping bags, somewhere between the floating masses of ice. Overnight, the crash of the moving ice has kept the explorers awake, and in the morning they find they've been driven southwards. They're only 25 kilometers from their departure point of Wales, not exactly where they wanted to be. Oh, Art Dixie calling. Art Mordvet is a seasoned pilot. He knows the Bering Strait very well. According to him, the polar explorers are now on a straight line due south between Wales and the uninhabited King Island. You would not suggest a landing or a hideaway place so that we would navigate towards King Island. Over. Dixie and Troy are considering camping on King Island in order to await better conditions. Thank you, thank you. Bye. It is island. No one there. Rocky cliffs. Um, for a refuge, place of refuge, extreme case, no problem, um, if you have the choice, why? So, that answers our question. I think so. And like you said, Troy, also, we can miss it. I mean, we have very little control here. By uh, noon, we can already... Uh, they don't reach King Island. Strong currents and very thin ice prevent them from getting there in this unstable world of moving ice. Just like our um, departure, so many elements are at play and two major um, players are of course the drift and the northwesterly winds that uh, have a major role pushing us in a direction that we do not want to go of course. Even with perfect weather forecasts, the Bering Strait apparently as soon as you have a suddenly drift, there's no way to counter it with your progression. The speed on foot will never exceed a half a mile an hour. So if we go at the same speed of the drift, we will not get nowhere. Luckily, there's Julie to motivate them. I think if you can get closer to the coast and then get yourself up without the current, then you can head on back over. They're searching for what to do because they keep drifting southeastward and um, just wanting to talk, just wanting some opinions. As far as the eye can see, as far as the eye can see. Their only chance of not being totally swept away is to reach King Island. But there seems to be no way out of this crazy labyrinth of scattered blocks of ice and open water. They leave in a northwesterly direction, against the current. As far as the eye can see. We continued on until it took us too far north, and then we uh, went back into the rubble and the ice pack and headed west and after a short time heading west we found miles and miles and miles of good ice, um, new ice that we could travel on. So we're looking forward to tomorrow morning getting on this new ice. Hopefully the slush is frozen some more and we'll make for smooth sailing.
During the night, movements of ice have brought the intrepid explorers closer to King Island, now approximately 22 kilometers away. The skies are clear, which is a real boost for them. To counter the drift, they'll have to continue their hard march in a westerly direction. Once again, King Island is their objective. This time they make good progress, and a steady pace gets them within two kilometers of the King Island shoreline. However, they're prevented from getting there by open water. A little further south, they find a passable snow bridge. Troy makes it across with no problem. When Dixie goes to follow, the ice starts moving again. King Island looms in the distance, but they'll have to wait until tomorrow. We were kind of locked up again in a, in a labyrinth of ice and slush. That is just a matter of using your instinct, animalistic almost, smelling your way out, uh, sniffing uh, through the blocks and the compression zones, a way out. The good thing is that uh, I love being here. It's just a pleasure. I, I, I really soak it all in. For the first time on this expedition, the explorers haven't drifted very far in the night. The wind, however, has freshened. Yet another problem for them to deal with. King Island is approaching. But the very bad ice conditions, so very typical for the Bering Strait, prevent them once again from reaching this intermediate goal. Dixie and Troy see King Island gaining in size, but far too slowly. Up until now, they've made an average of one and a half kilometers per hour against a current of 750 meters per hour. Their dream of reaching Russia is beginning to melt like snow in the sun. It's becoming clear that new options need to be discussed. A walrus greets the polar explorers. With gracious movements, this huge mammal teasingly dives underwater. He's the only one here who will reach Russia today without any problem. Julie has decided to take the plane to Little Diomed, one of two islands in the middle of the strait. She hopes to catch a glimpse of Dixie and Troy. Left window! Sorry, we've got passengers on board. Here, over. We have good lunches, good lunches. <laughs> hey, Joe, can you look around and see what the, this ocean is doing for us? Love you back. We'll enjoy the pizza, thanks. <laughs> it's good to talk over the radio. For a moment, the team can put aside the difficult position Dixie and Troy are actually in. The current is taking us south, straight down south. It's all not so good for the whole expedition, and we have to uh, now decide whether or not we'll keep on going westward, knowing that we will be pushed back uh, mostly southward. So we 
will most likely uh, talk to Julie about that tonight. The expedition has drifted too far from their original goal. The current and the weather, the greatest enemy of basically every Bering Strait expedition, have brought an early close to this adventure. Moreover, a heavy storm threatens. Dixie and Troy have no choice but to surrender to the forces of nature and call for a pickup. Okay, roger, roger. I just went out the tent and visibility is good. Wind strength is about a uh, wind strength is about 25 to 30, 35 maximum kilometers per hour. Landing is possible within the 100 meter radius of the tent, over and out. And my only one remaining question is, when is the pickup foreseen this morning? Over. After only eight days, Dixie Dunsacour and Troy Henkels had no choice but to call a halt to their ambitious expedition. They toyed with the idea of attempting a second crossing, but after careful consideration and weighing up the potential risks, they dropped the idea. Despite their wealth of experience in conducting polar expeditions, they had no choice but to acknowledge Mother Nature's supremacy. However, it has been a good lesson in humility, one they're more than willing to accept. Something that can only make you into a better person, ready to face all that life can throw at you. very happy to be able to live this moment of closure. The expedition was an intense one, probably also a dangerous one, an expedition full of um, uncertainties and doubt. And then in the final stages, um, respect for nature, that is always strong than humankind.